morning and welcome to worship on this first Sunday in Advent. We are so excited that you're here, whether you're with us here in person or you're worshiping with us online. We are beginning our Advent series today from generation to generation. And what an amazing way to start out an intergenerational sermon series with uh, an act of uh, confirmation today uh, and welcoming new members. So we are just very excited that you're here today. Out in the narthex, you should have received a white bag, and if you didn't receive one, you can get one on your way out. These are Advent bags, and in it are some things that I just want to make sure you know what to do with. Uh, first of all, in it is a devotional guide. Um, I'd like you to use this throughout the season of Advent. There's songs, there's recipes, there's art, there's prayers, there's all kinds of wonderful things. And this goes along with the theme that we're doing in worship. Um, so everything is kind of geared towards this in this season. Uh, also, and thank you to uh, Cheryl Love and Ricky Love for stapling all 95 of these. Also in there is an Advent calendar, and there's some crayons in there, and you may think that the crayons are for the children. They're not, they're for the adults, because kids already have crayons. But if you haven't colored for a while, um, I'd like you to do some coloring in this. And this Advent calendar has some activities that you can do every day in December, so I'd really like you to do that. Um, also, there are some star cards, and these were printed um, courtesy of uh, Laura Haley and Concert Pro, and they, she does beautiful work, um, and these are really wonderful. So what we're going to do with these cards, you can do anything you want to with them. You can uh, punch a hole in it and decorate your Christmas tree with them, but uh, at least once a week, take one of these cards and just pray over it. See what it is, um, what it reminds you of. Maybe look up the word in the dictionary and then pray about how God is going to use that word uh, through the week for you. Just kind of a way to meditate on the, on the word. And then on Epiphany, you're going to bring in the word that meant the most to you and give it to somebody else and that'll be a word that guides them for the year. So anyway, just some fun things for you to uh, engage a little bit more into Advent. Um, so feel free to grab one of those on your way out. And so now we invite our Advent candle lighters uh, to kick off our season of Advent with our Advent candle lighting liturgy. My two-year-old son. Dogs wagging their tails. Talking with young people. Kindness from strangers. Spending time in the woods. Waffles. Hands clasped in prayer. Social progress. The way my son calls everyone buddy. The ringing of church bells. Babies trying over and over to take their first step. The turning of seasons. Christian community. Books. Friendship with my adult children. Advocates for justice. Hearing children in the pews sing the hymns. The sunrise every single morning. And what gives you hope? Today, we light the candle of hope to remind ourselves that God is at work in this world. From generation to generation, God has brought good news of love and compassion, justice and community. Let us rest and abide in that good news. Amen.
uh, Corinne Nassar is going to come up for a second and talk about our angel tree that's happening starting today. Good morning. This is actually a mission moment, so this is just the first installment. And I want to talk about two um, timely missions here during the Christmas season. Um, as we're doing our shopping, and we're so grateful for all the abundance that we have, um, remembering those who are less fortunate. So um, Miss Bonnie Williams has her um, Christmas in the City um, in affiliation with Hope Helps, and she has this list out there of items, if you can contribute any of those. What's nice about this list is there's all different price ranges here. It's everything from um, holiday food to um, clothing items to toys and gift cards. So whatever you're able to give. And I noticed her box out there. She, she had it out last week and was handing these out. Um, the box is getting full, which is great. <laughs> um, and she needs those back um, to be distributed in mid, um, well, in the next couple of weeks. So she needs them back next Sunday, the 4th of December. And then the second mission, um, also related to gift giving and sharing, is the Angel Tree, which this is our third annual um, Angel Tree event. And um, thank you to Pastor Ann for providing a small tree out there in the North X. And I had, as I was walking in, trying to be on time for this, um, uh, I saw a few people and many people are asking me about the angels. They will be up by the time you exit here. I'm gonna go decorate those. But um, if you are willing to contribute to the angel tree, these are gifts for students at the school where I teach. And um, these are um, numbered here. So if you decide to sign one out, I have a sign out sheet here. Just put your name next to the red number that's on the angel. And then um, on the back, uh, they describe on the front, they show whether it's for a boy or a girl and the age um, of the child. And then on the back, they have a wish list. Um, by no means are, is anyone expecting all of these gifts, but a gift or two would be wonderful. I had a suggestion um, that if you are buying more than one gift, if you could wrap them in similar paper so that we know that they go together, and then also include this with the gift when you return it. These gifts need to be back by the 11th, which is two weeks from today, to be distributed that week before we take our holiday break. So thank you all. You've always been very generous, and we appreciate all that you're giving to the kids out there. More to add. Sorry. Just one thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. I meant to say that. <laughs> thank you. That was supposed to be part of the plug. Yes. So for the... Um, Christmas in the city, please bring unwrapped gifts to be put in the box out there. And um, those are due next Sunday. And then the angel tree, um, if you are able to wrap them, that's wonderful. If you are not, we can have a wrapping party, which we've done before, and it's a lot of fun. So um, either way, with these, just make sure you include the angel back. And those are due in two weeks. So thank you. Appreciate you all. Thank you so much for that. It's really a wonderful way, especially with our children and grandchildren, to uh, teach them about purchasing gifts for uh, people in the community. So as we uh, prepare to celebrate our confirmation and new members reception, brothers and sisters in Christ, through the, the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. All this is God's good gift offered to us without price. Through confirmation and through the reaffirmation of faith, we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledge what God is doing for us, and affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. So we're going to start with having the, um, the people being confirmed coming forth first. So I will invite Henry Halterman, Chase Jones, And Samuel Schmidbauer. And uh, each of these uh, young people has also a friend in faith, and so I would like to invite their friend in faith to come forward too. If Chris Lilly will come forward, and Matt Kern, and Bill Fabian, and stand next to your friend. <laughs> Thank you. 
And as a church together, we are all going to um, renew these, these questions that we've asked, and, uh, and we'll all do this together. Okay? On behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, everyone say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? So, so I do. According to the grace given you, Will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? If so, say, I will. Amen. And now for the friends in faith. Will you who sponsor these candidates support and encourage them in their Christian life? If so, say, I will. And you, the church, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons before you now in your care? Join together. So, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness that they may grow in their trust of God and be found faithful in their service to others. We will pray for them that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. Let us join together now in professing the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe. suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? invite uh, the confirmands now to, um, to remember your baptism. And so what you'll do is you'll just come to the water. You can just touch the water. You can make the sign of the cross on your forehead or whatever you would like to do in that. And then, um, and then you'll come over here and kneel. So that would be a way. <laughs> And also, as they come forward and kneel, I'm going to ask their families if they would come. Um, so, Henry, if you'll come here, and Chase, and Samuel, and uh, their families can just come and stand behind them. You can uh, kneel down here. And we have, um, as we remember their baptisms, we uh, actually are remembering their baptisms, and we have pictures of, uh, of their baptisms. And so, uh, you all get a chance to remember those. Henry, the Holy Spirit, work within you, that having been born through the water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Chase, the Holy Spirit, work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Samuel, the Holy Spirit, work within you, that having been born through the water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so now we're going to um, invite our new members to also come forward. So I would like uh, for Annabelle Torres to come forward, and Heidi Williams, Ganelle Mann, and Amanda can certainly come up with you. And you guys stay here. We're not done yet. 
So, <laughs> but you can come and join the uh, new members and yes, you can stand this way. So um, let me introduce you to our new members. This is Heidi Williams. Um, we're really excited about Heidi being here and she uh, has been looking for a church that has the spirit of inclusion and that's been something that is really important to her and so uh, Tuscawilla has been a church that uh, that has, has shown her that spirit. And so um, also I want to introduce you to Annabelle Torres and her daughter, Amanda. And so uh, they got really excited about the pumpkin patch. <laughs> and uh, so we've been really excited to see uh, how much they've worked in that. And Ganell, why don't you come over here? Ganell is uh, an ordained elder in the Free Methodist Church. And so she will be uh, associating with our church, but uh, clergy generally don't. Uh, become members of our church. And these three that are now becoming members today of our church uh, have also been involved in a lot of really amazing things. Um, I really appreciate Ashley Lilly's work as she has uh, worked with these, uh, these young people. I appreciate the clergy that have uh, worked with them to help them uh, walk them through the confirmation process. And um, when I ask each one of them about uh, if they were ready to be confirmed and um, and what that meant to them. They just really had a beautiful understanding of this. And I'm really excited about what they bring to the life of our church. So as we continue into the, um, the reception of new members, um, all of you will answer this. As members of Christ Universal Church, will you be loyal to Christ through the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries? If so, you will say, I will. As members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? If so, say, I will. And now to you, members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and your care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. And now if you'll respond. We give thanks for all that God has given you. We welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. And I also want to mention that, uh, that Gay's husband, Bill, will also be joining us. And so um, he's not able to be with us today, but we will uh, welcome him as a member of our church as well. And so now um, hear this word of blessing. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. Amen. And how about a round of applause for our country names and our new members? So, so um, Ashley, if you'll come forward, I know Ashley has a Bible and a certificate for each of the confirmands. We welcome you to our church, and we are so glad that you are all here. And so uh, now go in peace, and you may be seated. And now it's uh, time for our children's moment. <laughs> Kids, come on up while you're walking up. Be looking up here on the screen. Let's try to figure out what this is together. You can just call out your guesses. All right, we got another one. Let's see if we can guess the next one. Congregation, you can play too.
All right, good guessing, guys. The very beginning of, today is the very beginning of Advent. We have been waiting in Children's Church to turn our calendar over to purple. I had to wear purple just, for, just special for today because today's the day we get to enter the purple time of Advent where we get ready for the mystery of Christmas. And at the very beginning of that story, we get something called genealogy. And that is who had who had who had who had who uh, whose father is whose father is whose father whose mother is whose mother and we go all the way back and so if we look at god's story from the very beginning to the very ending and we look at just one part of it it doesn't really make much sense right we can look at that one little story but we don't see the way that it plays into God's big, great story until we zoom out a little bit and we look at what God has done from the beginning all the way to the ending. So we, for, for example, we have this amazing story of David in the Bible. Great story. But when we zoom out even further and we see the ways that God promised a a messiah through that family and we see the part that that one story plays in God's big great story everything starts to make more sense and so even in our lives things are going to happen that we don't really understand why they're happening we're looking at one little dot on a page or one little line marked in our story and when we zoom out and we look at what God is taking that part and what God is doing in the greater story, we'll see that he's painting a beautiful picture that is our lives. And our life story is also just a little moment in God's big, greater story. And so that's why we played our zooming out game. When we look really, really close, sometimes things don't make sense. And when we zoom out, we can see that God is doing some really great things, even when they don't make sense. So uh, we are going to say a prayer, and then I'm going to let you pick one of these uh, Chrismon ornaments out of the tree. Each one uh, is a symbol representing something in the season of Advent. So this one's a butterfly, represents transformation. This one's a crown, remembering the king of kings. There's different symbols inside of our basket. After we pray, I'll let you take one. You can put it up on our tree, and then we'll walk out for Children's Church, okay? That's the, that's the routine. All right, so let's pray. God, thank you so much for the season of Advent where we get ready for your coming. We will remember how important you are in the big story of life. We love you. Help us to grow closer to you every day. In Jesus' name, amen. I issue now a call to confession. In God's house, everyone is welcome. Those who seem like they have it all together and those who feel like their world is falling apart. No matter who we are, there's room for us here. With that confidence, we turn to God in prayer, speaking the truth of our lives. And now as we pray together, this is a congregational response prayer congregation's response will be in the bolder letters. And let us pray. God of today and God of tomorrow, you say, bring your full self. There's room for you here. 
You say, bring your hopes and your dreams. There's room for you here. But we say, it's too risky to hope. You say, bring your grief and your prayers. There's room for you here. But we say, some things are easier to forget. God of today and God of tomorrow, we know in our hearts that there's room for us here. Forgive us for withholding our full selves from you. Forgive us for giving only our Sunday best. Help us remember today and tomorrow. There's, There's room, room for every story. And now hear these words of forgiveness. Family of faith, we who feel scattered are held together. We who have lost our way are forgiven and found. And we who are lonely are brought into the fold and are told, there's room for you here. From generation to generation, this is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are held, forgiven, found, and welcomed. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now if the ushers will come forward for our morning offering. Let us pray. God of peace and justice, in the past year we have once again witnessed the fruits of war, lives cut short, children made orphans, homes devastated, and hearts broken. We pray to see the day that Isaiah saw in his heart when swords are pounded into plowshares. These gifts we give this morning, may they be used to make human hearts ready for peace and for the reign of your Son. In his holy name we pray. Amen.
a time of prayer. God of the ages, in scripture we hear stories of people like us, ordinary people, people who long to know you, people who long to follow you, people who made mistakes, people who tried to grow, old, young, native, immigrant, new to the faith, lifelong believer. In scripture, we hear stories of people like us. So just as you walked with them, help us to hear and remember all the ways that you walk with us. We are listening, we are grateful, we are yours. Amen. Today's first scripture comes from Matthew chapter one, verses one through 17. An account of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Omnidab, and Omnidab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijab, and Abijab the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Isaiah, and Isaiah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Ezekiel, and Ezekiel the father of Maniasah, and Maniasah the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconia, and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sal Salathiel, and Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abuad, and Abuad the father of Ilakim, and Ilakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim and Akim the father of Eluid, and Eluid the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathen, and Mathen the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, and the husband of Mary, who bore Jesus, who is called the Messiah. So, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. The second scripture. <laughs> The second scripture reading comes from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. The word that Isaiah, son of Amos, was concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, he shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Ashley, for reading all those names. I know it's everybody's favorite part of uh, beginning a reading of the New Testament is to read all of that, uh, that genealogy. But it really is important for where we're beginning today, for where we're starting. So I want to just think about that a little bit. Now, what if those names weren't all of those hard to pronounce names that Ashley did such a great job? We always say, just do them with confidence and you'll be fine. <laughs> she did great. Um, what if the names that we read instead were uh, Tom Sawyer? Scarlett O'Hara, Dorothy Gale, and Ebenezer Scrooge. What would be happening if you read those names? You would be thinking of stories, right? You would be thinking of each of those, those uh, characters' stories and uh, how they evolved or how they transformed or you would remember. And, and some of those characters, you'd have a very new memory of our children's um, community theater just talking about Dorothy, uh, and last year around this time talking about Ebenezer Scrooge. And so you would have recent memories as well as maybe for some of us that read those stories a long time ago. What if the names that we read in this genealogy 
or names like Barbara Riddle, Corky Arthur, Charlie Reeve, Jill Heckert. When we read those names, we would think about some people that have been foundational at Tuscawilla United Methodist Church. We would think about uh, Barbara Riddle and uh, her being the founder of, or the one that started this, um, this congregation here. We would think about Corky Arthur and his passion for feeding people who are hungry. Uh, we'd think about Charlie Reeb and his powerful preaching. And we'd think about Jill Heckert and all of the uh, productions that she liked to do, the musicals and the, uh, the things where she engaged the whole community in those, those things. And so our understanding of these genealogies depend on how well we know and love these people that we're reading about as we read them. Diana, Diana Butler Bass talks about these genealogies as being stories of belonging, of our sacred location in God. In knowing our roots, we come to know ourselves. And so if these names sound to you like blah, 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 um, I invite you to join with us next year when we begin reading uh, again the Bible in a year and we start reading in the Old Testament and, uh, and start to know some of these names and some of their stories. I think it's interesting how they mark these, uh, these 14 generations. So the first one is from Abraham to David, and they mention all of those people. And then the next one is from David to the deportation to Babylon. And then the last group of people is another 14 generations where it's talking about from Babylon to the Messiah. So I, I picked out just one person from each of these three different eras just to think about a little bit. A few weeks ago we talked about Nashon, and I'm not sure how to pronounce that either. I kind of like the Nashon. That's probably a better way to say it, but I don't, I've just always called him Nashon, probably because I'm Southern, I'm from Kentucky, and that's you know the kind of way we would say everything. Um, so when we talked about him, we were talking about him walking into the Red Sea and that he got all the way up to his neck before the water parted. Well, it mentions him in here, but it also mentions his father in here, uh, Aminadab, is his father. And I have my um, uh, First Nations translation version of the Bible, which I really love reading from. And when they talk about all these people in the genealogy, they also have their tribal names. So um, Aminadab is called noble relative, which makes sense because his son was very, uh, very courageous, right? So that to me adds a little bit more to the story that uh, now when you think about Aminadab, it's like, oh yeah, he w had a very courageous son. And um, that's, uh, that's really wonderful. So from the next generation, I thought I would choose Jehoshaphat. Anybody ever said jumping Jehoshaphat? Well, once again, Southern, so, you know, <laughs> jump on Jehoshaphat. And so I was trying to figure out, like, where did that come from? Like, where did we say that? And everything that I found in my uh, intense research online was saying that it's kind of ironic because um, Jehoshaphat was actually really known for standing still. And so uh, in Chronicles, Second Chronicles, uh, Judah is threatened with invasion, and Jehoshaphat and his people pray to God for help. And then the Lord tells them, the battle is not yours, but God's. Take your position, stand still, and see the victory of the Lord on your behalf. And so jump and Jehoshaphat doesn't jump, he stands still. So, you know, your story could also be mischaracterized like that. Just letting you know what future generations might do with uh, however it is that you serve, however faithfully it is, you can always end up uh, having your story distorted. My favorite Bible name, and every time I know somebody who's having a boy, I always recommend that they name this boy Zerubbabel. <laughs> <laughs> because I just see potential for all kinds of fun nicknames with that. But um, what a great name. And so, uh, you know, how much do we, do we know about Zerubbabel? He was responsible for laying the foundation of the temple once they returned from Babylon. It's a name we should know, right? That was kind of an important job. He was the, he was the trustee chair, right? <laughs> um, so I was thinking this week as I watched uh, Spirited on uh, Apple TV and another telling of um, A Christmas Carol. 
And one of the things that, that struck me was how much that story resonates with us because when people tell us stories from our past and our present and our future, it really has a big impact on us. And so in thinking about our lives as our past and our present and our future, um, I just want to think about that for a little while today. So as we think about our Christmas past, all of these names that Ashley just so faithfully read are all names that are part of our past. And they're people that we might want to know their stories a little bit more uh, because they might inspire us for the things that we have ahead of us. Uh, how great is it to hear stories of courage and stories of faithfulness? But even more, how important is it to hear from people who get it wrong and then God pursues them and redeems them. In uh, Spirited, they, they have one of the characters stamped as unredeemable. And we believe that no one is unredeemable, that everyone is able to be redeemed by God's grace. So we come now then to our Christmas present. And what a joyful way to be in our Christmas present today. Uh, if we were calling out the names of our present today, we would call out Henry and Chase and Samuel and Annabelle and Amanda and Heidi and Gay and Bill and, and everybody that's gathered here today. That these are the names of our present, the people that are experiencing God's call to be part of this work here. People who are listening to Corinne talk about uh, angel trees and Christmas in the city and thinking about this is one of the things that we do in our, our present, that we do things to let people in the world know that we love them and that God loves them. We have a, an unfolding of stories that are taking place in our congregation. And as we get to know each other, as we break bread together, as we share Bible studies and small groups and choir rehearsal and uh, trustee work days, we get to know more of everyone's story, where people came from, uh, and how they are actively involved in living out their faith, in living out the way that God has called each one to serve. Well, as Catherine mentioned in her children's moment, our journeys, we usually just look at the individual part and we think about our own individual journey. But they're woven together with the journeys of other people. You know, Barbara Riddle shared, uh, we had a, soon after I got here, we had a clergy dinner at my house, and uh, she shared about how difficult it was for her to be ordained as a female uh, back in, I, I can't remember if she was uh, ordained in the, in the early 80s or, uh, but sometime around that time, it was a big challenge for her to um, convince people that she had been called to ministry and that this was, uh, this was something that God had put on her heart to do. And I think for me, there was never a concern about my gender in being ordained. And so her story is woven into my story in a way that she paved the way for me to go through this process without anybody else saying, oh, but you're a female. They had other things that they asked about, so it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't a total walk in the park. But, um, but nobody questioned whether I could be ordained and be female. And so it's amazing uh, what's happened. Uh, last week I shared about my Aunt Charlotte, and um, as some of you read in the newsletter, I, I got home after sharing about her to find that she had died uh, last Sunday morning. So while I was talking about her in church, uh, she passed away at home. And so all this week, um, I've been pulled back into the past, thinking about memories and thinking about stories. And one of the things that was amazing about Aunt Charlotte was that she had worked as a secretary for uh, the college, University of Louisville, big, um, big Louisville fan there. And um, she uh, decided one day, kind of as an older adult, I wonder if I'm smart enough to go to law school. And she actually took an IQ test <laughs> to see if she was smart enough to go to law school. And she decided to do it. And she became a really wonderful lawyer. And it was her calling. It was how God was calling her to serve 
Um, she helped a lot of people that, uh, that otherwise might not have had legal representation. And, one of, and that was kind of her own journey, but one of the ways that got woven into my story and some of the younger cousins' stories was that we also thought, we, you know, well, maybe we didn't miss the boat on going to college right after high school. Maybe we could also go back to school. And so I went back to school not once as an adult, <laughs> but twice. I went back to school to get a music degree, and then I went back to school to get a Master of Music degree, and then I actually went back to school to get a Master of Divinity degree. But Aunt Charlotte inspired me, because if she could do it, then we all had hope of being able to do it. When we talk about our authentic journeys and we share about how God is calling us and how we are faithful, we pave the way for other people, and we inspire other people to do uh, whatever God is calling them to do. In, in the uh, movie Spirited, it talks about the ripple effect. And this weaving of our lives together is part of the ripple effect. Is that when God works in one person's life, that ripples out and it, it transforms other lives around them. And so that's where we are right now in our present. That's what we're doing here in the congregation. So if somebody asks you if you'll uh, serve on the Connections team or if you'll make cookies or if you'll be an online host if you're just sitting home already, uh, it's not just, oh, I don't want to do that thing. It's like, this is something that could shape somebody else's story. My engaging in this small act might be something that invites someone else into their own sacred story of knowing Jesus. So then we think about our future. And as I was pondering the future, uh, Richard Rohr had a post today where he was talking about a conversation with Brian McLaren and asked the question, what is the future of Christianity? And he acknowledged right away that that question is a little bit difficult. Because in asking what is the future of Christianity, it might make some people think that that might be different than the past of Christianity. And for some people, that's terrifying, that the future might look different than what the past looked like or what the present looks like. But it was really wonderful um, in acknowledging that danger. Uh, he went on to describe uh, some other dangers in that. One is that if we think everything was fine in the past, then we can be apathetic about thinking everything will be fine in the future. We don't need to do anything. This is just rolling by itself. The other danger is thinking that church is so much of a mess that it doesn't even matter what we do. We'll just stand aside and wait till everybody sorts everything out. But the alternative here is another way of asking this question and engaging the question with an open heart, an open imagination, and an open mind. And that's the way that leads to this sense of empowerment for us to open up to the ways that the future of Christianity could be influenced by what we know our story begins with. One person impacting 12 people who impacted several hundred more. Jesus influenced his disciples and each one was sent out to do work in the world. Each one of us is sent out to do something in the world. And it's exciting when we hear that call. So then we turn to our passage from Isaiah. And Isaiah is such a hopeful passage about the future. If you're like me, sometimes you watch the news and you just go, oh gosh, why, why can't we stop shooting each other? Why can't the, this violence end? And sometimes we think that passing laws is the way to do that, and maybe that's the right way. But we know that this hope that Isaiah is talking about is the hope that we have in God. That it's our job, it's not that we just pawn it off on somebody else to go do this work. That all of these little ripples that we're creating in our, little, in our own ministries are ways that we are changing the world. And it talks about in this passage that uh, Isaiah describes this highest mountain. And uh, it's this place where heaven and earth meet. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's literally a high mountain. Many of us have had 
these places where heaven and earth meet. And many times we find that high place on bended knee in serving somebody else. I know some of my, uh, some of my thinnest places where I feel the closest to God are when I'm rocking a crying baby. And thank goodness for the happy song. If you've never heard the, the happy song, come see me. It's magic for babies. <laughs> But sometimes that's where, in serving, that's where we really find the mountaintop. There's a sculpture at the United Nations headquarters that has this, uh, this image of, of beating their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. It says, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So when we think of our dreams, we think of a dream of peace that is not only the cessation of fighting, not only that we stop shooting each other, but also this sense of peace where every single one of us finds wholeness. Every single one of us finds completeness as a disciple of Jesus. In the new year, we're going to talk about individual financial wholeness. How do we get through our own personal money issues, whether we have too much money? Anybody have that? I've got ideas for you. Um, anybody that has too little money? How do we work together and have conversations as a church where we all become whole together? And so as we enter into the season of Advent today, we remember our glorious history, even with all those people whose names we don't know how to pronounce. We think of all who have gone before us in our lives and our ministries. We take up the cross and we follow Jesus today anew. We grow closer to Jesus in this season. And we dream about the future, not only for Tuscaloosa United Methodist Church, but what our lives and our ministries mean to the community and to the world. How far can our ripples go when we trust God and we faithfully walk in the ways that he calls us. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for all of the stories that you have invited us to be part of. We pray that we will live just as faithfully as the people that we admire. We pray for those who have joined the church today that you will lift them up and inspire them in their ministry, that you will do great things through them. And we pray that our church will be a light to the world that points to you and that through your light, people will experience your peace and your wholeness. We pray your blessing on this congregation in Jesus' name. Amen. Affirmation of faith. We believe in a God who, who promised, promised to Abraham, Abraham who, who wrestled with Jacob, who walked with Ruth, who spoke with Moses, who grieved with Bathsheba, who danced, danced with, with David, David, who dreamed with Joseph, Joseph and who hoped like Mary. We believe, we believe in a God who has been loving, inviting, transforming, and challenging us from generation to generation. And we believe that somehow is here with us now, saying, come on in, there's room for you here. Amen. And of course, when there is room at the table, uh, we all come together and we feel what it means to share this table with Jesus. We include everyone in this table, and we know that Jesus loves this time to be with us. And so just like he shared this time with his disciples, he shares this time with us today. And we remember this sacred story of this meal together, where Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks to God, he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take, eat, 
This is my body, which is given for you. Do this as often as you will. When the supper had ended, he took the cup. He gave thanks to God, gave it to the disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you will in remembrance of me. And now I invite you to bow your heads as we experience a time of prayer together. God of Abraham and Isaac, God, as we gather at this table, we bow our heads today hoping to catch a glimpse or a shimmer of you. We know that you are here with us just as you walked with every generation before. So we bring you our prayers. Thank you for creating space for us. Thank you for seeing our scattered thoughts, our imposter syndrome, our fragments of doubt, and still saying, come on in. Thank you for seeing our ordinary selves with anxious concerns and unflattering habits and saying, I have bigger plans for you. Thank you for seeing our fragile egos, our uncertain relationships, and saying, you still belong here. Your expansive love makes room for us to breathe, and we want to love with our lungs and hearts full. So today we pray, teach us how to make that same room for others. When we come face to face with stories that are different from ours, show us how to add chairs to the table. When we find ourselves face to face with stories that frustrate and test our patience, show us how to build bridges instead of walls. When we find ourselves face to face with stories that feel foreign or unrelatable, remind us to open the door and to listen carefully. From Abraham to Mary, you made room for every story, and that love continues to make room for us. Teach us to do the same for our neighbors, so this world will know love. And now, with the confidence of children, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. The bread that we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. If our communion servers will please come to the front. Stephanie, the body of Christ given for you. Ron, the body of Christ given for you. Mary, the body of Christ given for you. Eliza, the body of Christ given for you. Blood of Christ shed 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 for you. I want to remind you that we have uh, gluten-free elements as well, if you need those. Uh, and also a reminder that this is an open communion table, that all are welcome. These are the gluten-free, by the way. If you'd like to engage in a time of prayer, I will be um, over here um, and would invite you to come and pray with me. Amen.
are grateful for every bit of it. We thank you so much for those young people who were confirmed today and the new members who have joined our church and for every faithful person in this room who took vows to support them on their journey. God, may you make us a vibrant community of faith where each person walks into the life that you have for them. Help us to love each other and support each other and to truly know that all of our stories, although they're different, are all very important. We pray your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And uh, before I give the benediction, if our new members and our confirmands can go out into the narthex, because I know everybody wants to greet you, so if you guys will go ahead and just head out uh, into the narthex and um, be ready to, to greet some people. Hear these words of benediction. As you leave this place, may you go knowing that from generation to generation, we have been claimed and loved. From generation to generation, God has been by our side. From generation to generation, we are not alone. The God of yesterday and the God of tomorrow knows you by name, loves you, and calls you forth saying, go be the person you are called to be. Love wildly, do justice, and come back soon. May it be so. Amen. Amen. Amen.